God, we honor and thank you, Lord. All your mercies and grace, Lord Jesus. God, we praise you. Lord, we honor and thank you, Lord Jesus. God, we praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all your mercies and grace, Lord Jesus. God, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God, thank you, Lord. God, we praise you. Enter into his courts with thanksgiving, into his house with praise. Lord Jesus, we praise you, Lord. His courts with praise. Him. <clears throat> Lord, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. This morning, we're continuing on with our lessons on living, uh, living the faith, living what you believe. Uh, and this morning, we're talking about the influence of the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. And I have added a scripture to the lesson text. If you're going in your books, it won't be in there. It'll be up on the board. But I have added one to it. Uh, when, whenever we get to it, you'll see it there. Uh, the focus thought is, as transformed believers in the world, we can know and accomplish the will of God in our lives through the power of the Spirit. Focus verse is Ephesians 5 and 17. Wherefore, be you not unwise. Don't be unwise. Get you some wisdom. But understanding what the will of the Lord is. And what an ask from Paul. Think about this. Paul is telling us to understand the will of the Lord. For us to have a firm grasp on what God's desire and what his will is for us our life is. He said, make sure you understand it. Make sure you know it. Make sure you have a you have a grasp on it and you know what God is wanting for your life. He said, don't be unwise. He said, get you some wisdom and understand what God wants for your life. Lesson text is, uh, uh, is five and then I went to 14 instead of 15, 14 through 20. Um, Wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, at, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine. Don't be filling yourself up with junk of the world, but be filled up with the Spirit of the Lord. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, he says, talk to yourself a little bit once in a while. Um, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you may be seated. <laughs> Understanding what the de what God's desire. Boy, that's a, that's just think about that. Do, does everybody completely understand what God's will is for your life? I mean, do you really, do we completely, do we have a firm grasp on it? Because we kind of know what God's will, we know the direction that he kind of wants us in to go into. But sometimes it's, it's tough to be able to see that, to see what God's will is. How can, we, how can we get an understanding of what God's will is for us? But it's only through the influence of the Spirit of God. That, that's what the lesson is about. It's talking about the influence of the Spirit. The only way I can get an understanding of what God's will is for my life is by his influence, is by the influence of his spirit. Spirit. Um, last week the pastor was preaching. He mentioned how the veil of the temple was torn as Jesus died on the cross uh, and that it had allowed access to the presence of God, access to the presence of God. And so I had somebody kind of ask me, he said, explain that to me. Tell me what that means. And so, I, you know what, I explained it to him, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to talk about that briefly because it's kind of given us a little bit of insight into the Spirit of God. Uh, in the Old Testament, God had instructed Moses to construct the tabernacle uh, or God's dwelling place is basically what it was. Um, it was a portable dwelling place uh, for God that they would move with them, uh, Israel would move with them on their travels. It was about half the length of, of a football field, is about half the width of a football field, so it was basically a quarter of a size of a football field. That's a big tent. I don't know about y'all, but that's a pretty good sized tent to have to move around, and, and it was made up, and think about, we don't, they didn't have trucks, and they didn't have cranes, they didn't have stuff like that, it was just a bunch of guys putting it together, taking it apart, and every time that they would move, they'd have to tear it down, and every time that God would stop, they'd have to put it back together, and it was intricate, and there was a lot of things on the inside of it, and there was things from the outside of it, so you know what the wear and tear is, think about this, you, we know what wear and tear does to things as you put 
take things apart and put them together and take them, you know, take them apart and put them together. And every time you do that, it wears a little bit. But they had to be that careful with this because this was the dwelling place of God. Uh, it actually was uh, it was actually up for around 440 years until God had told uh, Solomon to build the temple. And so when you first went in into the tabernacle, you went into the courtyard, and the first thing you came to was you came to the altar. You came to the brazen altar. And that's where the sacrifices was made. And then as you pr proceeded into the, in, further into the courtyard, you came to the brazen laver, and that's where the water was, and that's where the, the priest would finish. And I'm not going to, I'm just doing a quick run through, and we're not talking a, a whole lot about this. Uh, but <clears throat> as you went further into the temple, you, uh, or into the tabernacle, you came to the temple, and it was a structure within the structure. And there was a veil that separated the, uh, the, the, the tabernacle from the outer court. And so as you go in there, you come to the table of shoe bread, and you come to the menorah, which was the lampstand. Uh, and you see in the, in the Jewish pictures, you know, you see the, the stand with all the candles on it. That was the menorah. And then you had the, the altar of incense. And then you would come to another veil. And so inside of this veil was the Holy of Holies. This was the holiest place uh, in the tabernacle. This is where the Ark of the Covenant sat, okay? There was no sunlight that would go into this. There was no candlelight. The only light that was in there was from the glory of God. It was called the Shekinah glory, and that was the glory of God. And the only light that would come through there, it was just basically the presence of God. The presence of God actually lit the place up. That's where, the, 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 that, that's where God's presence was. And it gave, uh, his presence gave light to the Holy of Holies. There was no voice that would be in there. The only voice that would be there was the voice of God. So in God's presence, in God's presence, and remember this, in God's presence, there was only his light and his voice. There was no other light. There was no other voice for direction. It was only came from God. The high priest entered into the Holy, Holy, uh, Holy of Holies once a year to give atonement for the sins. His head had to be bowed. His feet had to be bare. Uh, he was on holy ground. And if he had any sin in his life, you know what happened to him? He died. <laughs> that was it. If he go in there and you couldn't come into the presence of God with any kind of junk in your life because the moment that you went in there, bam, that was it. So the tabernacle was a visible reminder to the people of Israel that God was with them. Because they were spiritually dead, they could not feel the presence of God. They could not sense the presence of God. So it was a visible reminder. It was something that they could kind of catch with their senses. When they was given up to offerings, you could smell it. You could smell the incense. You could hear the animals. It was all just a reminder that was God was there. And, and, and But they were still not allowed to go into the presence of God except for the one man. It was for the high priest only. And so everybody else had to watch. But then as the pastor was preaching last week, when Jesus came and he died on the cross, all of that changed. Every bit about being able to come into the presence of God, all of that was changed when he died. Bring up Matthew 27, 51 and, uh, 50 and 51. When G Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. That was the body given up the spirit that was in it. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent from twain, from the very top of it all the way to the bottom of it, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. Okay? So this ushered in. It was about the, the Bible said it was about the ninth hour is about when all this happened. You know what took place at the ninth hour? That's basically when they would give that they would do the evening sacrifice in the in the temple. He was the sacrifice of our sins. All this stuff took place for a reason to give people an understanding of who Christ was, that he was the sacrifice for our sins. The veil represented the, the, the concealment of God. If you remember when Moses went up to see God, he was not allowed to see God. And then after he just seen the hinder parts, the Bible said they had to put a veil on his face because his, his face shined so much from the glory of the Lord. They had to put a veil so that the other people couldn't see Moses because they couldn't handle it. And so this veil was the concealment. And so what God says, no longer am I going to be concealed from man. No longer am I going to conceal my presence from man. He ran it from the very top to the bottom and he opened it up and it represented God now allowing us to have access to the presence of God. Bring up Hebrews uh, 10, 19, and 20. Having therefore, brethren, boldness, now we can enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Verse 20. By a new 
and a living way. It's no longer a dead way where you had to have sacrifices and you had to. It's now a living way. And that's why we got to know Jesus as the power, pastor priest. We got to know him in the power of his resurrection because it's all about life now. It's no longer about death. There was one sacrifice made for all of us. And now it's a new and it's a living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil. That we can go through the veil, that is to say, that was his flesh. So it's ushered in a new way of salvation, a new living way. Again, no longer marked by the death of animals, but it's marked by the life or the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we still had to spiritually go through all the natural things that the man of God had to do in the tabernacle. That they had to, that they had to do. You still was the process. What was the first thing that they had to come to? What did I say? The first thing to come to was what? The altar. The first thing, when the man went into the courtyard, he entered into the He went by the altar. They had to offer up the sacrifices. That's where we kill ourselves through repentance. Then the next thing he had to do was go to the laver. He had to go in, and he had to wash his hands and stuff. That's baptism. That's a representation of us, that we have to be baptized. Then you would come into the table of showbread and the lamp and the altar of incense, talk, representing the word and the praise and worship. And then you went into the Holy of Holies. Which we, no man was allowed to accept one, but now we have access. And these were Old Testament typifications of, sal of New Testament salvation. In order to get into the presence of God, to get to the presence of God, we have to go through these steps, okay? But once we do, we get to get into the presence of God. We, or God gets to get into us. That's the big thing. That's the big difference is we no longer come into the presence of God. God comes in with us. Jesus had talked to the disciples about giving them a comforter. Bring up John 14, 15 through 19. If you love me, keep my commandments. And then, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then I'll pray the Father and he will give you another comforter that, ye may ab that he may abide with you forever. Go ahead. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because seeth him not, neither knoweth him. 17, but ye know him, for he dwelleth. Now, who is he talking about here? The world can't see. He's going to bring you another comforter. The world don't know him, but you know him, because he's dwelling with you, and he shall be... Well, who in the world was dwelling with them except Jesus? He's not only going to be dwelling with them, he said, I'm going to be dwelling in you. I will not leave you comfortless, but he's saying... I will come to you. He is the comforter. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye, ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. Jesus said, I will come. Jesus said that the comforter can, would come, and it would dwell in him. We'll, we, will, we'll, we will live because he is alive, the new and that living way that we were talking about. And when he does, we'll no longer be spiritually dead. We come alive. We'll live, because just like what I added, that's the reason why I added that scripture, Ephesians 5 and 14. That's why I added this, because it's so important. Did I have that one, Ephesians 5 and 14? Wherefore he saith, waketh thou that sleepest. Those that are spiritually dead, awake up, rise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. He will put that light inside of you. He will put that influence, that thing that you need for influence. Once you arise from the dead, once you know him in the power of his resurrection, but to know him in the power of the resurrection, you've got to have the Holy Ghost. You've got to have the presence of God. And I'm jumping ahead here just a little bit. But we who are dead in sin can rise from the dead. And then Jesus went on talking about the Comforter. Bring up John 14 and 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I said unto you. Jesus said the Comforter will come. And it can't come until he's gone because that was his presence. His body had the presence in him. The comforter would dwell inside of them. Then he said, he would dwell. Then he said, then I'll dwell inside of you. And he said, the comforter is the Holy Ghost. It is the Spirit of God. So the Holy Ghost is the same Spirit that was in Jesus because Jesus said, I'm going to dwell in you, but physically he can't dwell in us. So he has to do it spiritually, right? The body gave up the ghost while it was on the cross. He, cry, he cried and it gave up the ghost and the presence of God went out of him. So we would have to do it spiritually. So Jesus, the spirit that was Jesus and the Holy Ghost are one. So let's throw one more into the mix. First John 5, 6 and 7. This is he that came by 
water and blood. When they pierced Jesus while he was up on the cross, what came out of him? What's the first things you come to into the tabernacle? Blood for the sacrifice, and you come to the laver. That's why blood's important, but water is just important as salvation. I know we talk about the blood, but i got to have water, too, because Jesus comes. It says even Jesus, not only by water only, but by water and blood. It emphasizes the water, and it emphasizes the blood. I've got to have both. I've got to have the water that cleanses, and I've got to have the blood that covers. I've got to have it all. Uh, or washes away. And it is, go ahead, sorry, uh, the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. And in seven, there are three that bear record in heaven. There's the Father, there's the Word. In the beginning, John 1, 1 says in the beginning, the same John that wrote this wrote, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you skip down to about the 14th verse, he said, and the Word was made flesh and that was Jesus so it so there are three that bear record in heaven the father or Jesus the son and the Holy Ghost and all these three are just one they're just one individual sharing the same it's the same spirit there ain't three individuals walking around up in heaven there are not talking amongst themselves it's one spirit it's just one spirit when again this was, it has to have the water and the blood so uh, there's just that one spirit so they're the same one. So one more scripture real quick, John 20 and 22. And when he had said this, this is Jesus after the resurrection, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, or here's my spirit. <laughs> That's where Jesus was allowing them, showing them. This was after the resurrection, and now he could share the presence with everybody else. Now it was opened up to everybody else. The Holy Ghost could... That's why Jesus is the Holy Ghost. That's why the Holy Ghost is the thing, is the Bible. In, in when overshadowed Mary, the Father, it was the Father. But it was the Bible said it was the Holy Ghost that overshadowed Mary. So that means the Holy Ghost is the Father. And Jesus said, "I and my Father are one." And me and Him right there can't say that we're one. We're two separate, completely individuals. My Dad sits right there. I can't say me and Dad are one because we don't agree on everything. There's some things that we don't agree. But Jesus and the Father and the Holy Ghost, they all agree in the same thing because they are the one. So, uh, again, so we have, uh, we've got the plan laid out for us in the Old Testament for New Testament salvation. So then we get to Acts 2.38. Peter said after he had preached to them, repent and be baptized. Everybody, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the Comforter. <laughs> you will receive the Comforter. You will receive the Holy Ghost. You've got to repent. You've got to be baptized in Jesus' name. And then the Comforter will come because the veil was tore. It was ripped open. It signified that we have access to the presence of God, but he would dwell inside of us with the Holy Ghost. So going back to what Paul said, be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is for us. How can I understand the will of the Lord? And it's only through the presence of the Holy Ghost inside of me. It's only when I have him inside of me can I completely really understand what God really wants me to do. What God wants in my life, I have to have that presence. I've got to have the Shekinah glory of the Lord. I've got to have the light. I've got to have the voice of God in me. In his presence only is his light and his voice. In, in the Holy of Holies, the only, the only light was his presence. The only voice was his presence. The only way that I can get his light and his voice inside of me is by getting his presence inside of me. That's the only way that I can get it. That's the only way that I can be able to hear. So we're having the presence of God, allowing him, God, to lead me and God to guide me and to direct my thoughts and to direct my actions. And when we do that, then I can have an understanding of what God's will is in my life. I can have an understanding. We can understand what it is he wants to do. But when we allow the world to eclipse the light of God, when we block out the light of God with everything else that's going on in the world, and we allow all the other noises that's in the world to block out the voice of God, there's no way that I can have a grasp on what God's will is for my life. 
When I'm seeing everything else out there and I'm not, have, I don't have the light of God in my life and the darkness of the world is covering it up. And when I'm not listening for the voice of the Lord and it's not in me and I'm hearing all the other junk, there's no way I can understand what, God's, what God wants in my life. And then you know what we're done? We're left asking questions. Why, God? Where are you, God? Where are you at in this? Because if you understand the will of God, you don't have to ask questions. <laughs> I don't have to ask questions, why this God, and why that God, and where are you, God? Because I know what God's will. If I have a firm grasp and I understand what God's will is in my life, I understand whatever it is that happens to me, I don't have to question. I'll just say, God, it's in your hands. I just trust you, God. I just believe you. I know it's just part of the path that we have to walk in this life. We can't have God's influence in our lives when we, don't, when we want to do our own thing. We don't get to do both we don't get to do it both ways. If you remember King Saul, excuse me, King Saul wanted God's influence in his life. He wanted God helping him fighting his battles, but he also wanted to do what he wanted to do. When it came time to offer up sacrifice and Samuel wasn't around, I'll go do it. Let me do it. It wasn't his responsibility. It wasn't his job, but I'll go do it. When it came time he was supposed to kill all the, king, the kings and all the people and all the animals, what did he do, decide to do? I'll just do what I want to do. I want to, take, I want to keep the best animals up for sacrifice. What good is a sacrifice when, I'm not, uh, when I don't understand God's will enough that I, to obey it? Obedience is better than what? Obed, I can sacrifice my life. I can lay down. I can go feed the poor and uh, sacrifice every minute of my life. Go feed the poor and help. But if I'm not obeying the word of God, I'm not obeying God's commandments, and I'm not in the will of God understanding, what good is it doing me? It's not doing me any good at all. If you love me, keep my commandments, and then I'll pray. If you love me, keep my commandments, and then. But what good is a sacrifice when I'm not obeying? So what happens when Goliath comes? Saul, I'll go out there. I've got the presence of God in my life. I'll kill him. Oh, no. Send somebody else. I don't have. I want to do things my way, and I'm not going out to go fight Goliath. And he was so spiritually blind. When David came up, he couldn't even see that David was the man that God sent to take care of Goliath. He could not even see, he, he couldn't understand. Here, let me give you, he couldn't see that David's trust was in the Lord. Here, David, put on my armor. Take my armor. Take this, take, take this, David. Here, I'll set you up and let you do it. He couldn't see that it was, God was the one that was leading him. Because he was so spiritually blind, he, had, he didn't have the light. He didn't have the influence of God in his life. Eli was the same way. He was the man of God, but he allowed the light in the temple to go out. He allowed his sons to run rampant and do whatever it was that they wanted in the, in the temple, in the tabernacle. He was in, he was in darkness. And when God was coming to set his, his, up his replacement, he was so blind and so deaf to the presence of God, he couldn't even tell that Hannah was praying, but instead thought she was drunk. Oh, that woman, she's, look here, she's drunk. She's in the, in the church, and she's down here at the altar, and she's drunk. Look at she mom. But she... He didn't have enough spiritual insight to be able to say, she's praying. And when Samuel was laying asleep and he heard the voice of the Lord crying out to him, and he thought it was Eli, and Eli said, oh, you're just hearing things. Go on back to sleep, boy. And finally he picked up on it, but it took him so long. A man of God, the man of God that had light and had the voice of God, the presence in them, they'd be able to say, yep, that's God. Yep, I understand that. Well, I was talking to him about it, and, and we were talking about uh, movings of the Spirit in, in Bible study on Friday night. And I was talking about, you can watch the pastor. You know, because Paul was talking about in Corinthians, he's talking about all things being done in order. And he was talking about, you know, tongues and interpretations. And the pastor could sit there and see, and you can watch him. If the presence of the Lord is moving and everybody's getting involved, you let it go, don't you, Pastor? Because that's when you know. But when you see one or two here and one or two there and everybody else, Pastor has to worry about everybody. He can't worry about, I and mean, you're sitting there, yeah, I want you to really bless this. And then everybody else is saying, I'm hungry. I want to be fed. I want to be, the pastor has to feed everybody. He has to make sure everybody gets blessed. He has to make sure. So then you'll do what? You'll go ahead and preach, won't you? Even while they're praying, he'll not shut it down, but he'll shut it down. Not shut it down, but he'll say, i got to preach. Because he's got enough spiritual insight to be able to say, everybody needs to eat. Everybody. Now, if everybody's getting blessed, let it happen. But when there's one or two there that's going on, and everybody else is just sitting here, because you know some of us all just sit here and do this right here while the presence of God's moving. And so he said, like, said, i got to feed everybody, because I don't want nobody to go home hungry. I don't want anybody to go home without a word of God. So you've got to have... 
you got to have that influence, okay? They both had an understanding of what God's will was, but, but because they wanted to do what they wanted to do, they had lost that influence from the presence of God because they wanted to do their, their things. They, they had lost that voice. They had lost God's influence on them. Bring up Jeremiah 10 and 23. Oh, Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. It's not inside of me to be able to rock, walk the right way. If I tried to do it on my, on my own, I'm lost. If I tried to make it to heaven on my own, if I tried to walk the path of God on my own, I'm doomed. I'm gutted. I'm in trouble. I, 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 I ain't got a hope. But I got a hope when I get the presence of God, when I obey the commandments, when I repent and I'm baptized and I get the Holy Ghost. Don't expect to be able to do God's will when you don't have the influence of God in you. But bring up Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into your understanding. In thy ways, in all thy ways, acknowledge him. Give him the glory. Say, God, whatever it is that you want, and he shall direct your path. God will direct your path when you begin to acknowledge him, and you give him the praise, and you give him the glory, and you give him the, the, the give him, uh, um, how do I want to say this? Allow him to have access to your life to direct it. Give him the wheel. Let him drive your life. Let him guide your life. Let him take the direction. God will direct our path, and he will show us his will by his voice. And by his light. And if we need course corrections once in a while, he'll even do that. <laughs> Dwayne, you need to clean up your life. Dwayne, you need to get rid of this. Dwayne, you need to pray a little bit more. Dwayne, you need to, you need to repent. You, Dwayne, you need to fast. Dwayne, you need to study the Word. Dwayne, you need to be a little bit more faithful to my house. If you really want to get, if you want to get your course corrected, you want to be on the path, you really want to know what the will is, Dwayne, you got to do th some things. We need to allow this presence of the Lord to be in us. But then when this presence is in there, we've got to hear it. We've got to listen to it, and we've got to obey it. When we obey his commandments, when we do what he has said to do, again, to repent, to baptize, and all that, but then we've got to continue to be walking in his presence. Once you, once you repent, once you baptize, once you fill with the Holy Ghost, it don't stop there. You've got to continue to walk in the presence of God to be able to hear the voice of God and be able to see the light of God. Then that's when we can expect to have the influence of God in our lives. That's when I can expect the Spirit. When I'm allowing Him in there and I'm walking in His presence, then I'm keeping Him in His presence. I'm staying in His presence. And then I can expect to be influenced by His, his Spirit. At the beginning of Ephesians 5, Paul's telling them, to walk in the love of Christ. At the beginning of this the chapter or verses where he's talking to them, walk in the love of Christ. And then he begins to caution them against the list of things, of sins that he's got in there that would pull them away from Christ. And he said, actually, don't even let them be named among you. Don't even let these things, don't even let it be said that you guys might be doing these things. He talks about fornication and uncleanness and covetousness. Filthiness, foolish talking, jesting, idolatry. He's talking about don't be deceived by vain words. He said, you were sometimes in darkness, but now you're in the light of the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Walk as if you got spiritual influence. Walk as if God is speaking to you. Walk as if God is giving you direction in your life. And then he prescribes... Then he prescribes some remedies. Bring up Ephesians. We've read this, Ephesians 5, 15, and 16. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Then 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Walk circumspectly. Walk not as a fool. Walk in, the, in a way that you are considering. Circumspect means to consider. It means walk in a way that you're considering the way that you're walking. You're thinking about what it is that you're doing. Bring up Ecclesiastes 5 and 1. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of, the, of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. The fools don't consider their ways. They just do it. If it feels good, that's what the motto of the world. If it feels good, do it. Yeah, if it, yeah, if it feels good to take this drug, drink this, do whatever. Ah, oh, yeah, just whatever it is, do it. It feels good. And that's what the flesh says, but that's also what the fool says. And he says, don't be a fool. They don't think about what they do, but the wise 
think about the way they walk. They think about the way they talk. They think about the way they look. They think about the way the way everybody else perceives them, especially God. It doesn't matter what I see. What really matters is what he sees. Because what I see don't matter. <laughs> I'm not the judge. I can sit there and judge somebody all day long. But truthfully, I am not the judge of anybody. It's God is the judge. Don't worry about what I think about the way you look. You better think about or talk or, or act or whatever else. You better act, but you better worry about what God thinks. Walk circumspectly and walk in a way that you say, am I walking in light and am I walking in the voice of God? They consider the possibilities. They want to know, is this taking me further away from God or is this bringing me closer into the presence of God? Is what I'm, they, 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 they think about it. They, they consider ways. They allow the Spirit to influence them and say, God, is, this, is what I'm doing today, is this going to take me closer to you or is what I'm doing today going to take me further away from you? Don't be a fool. Walk circumspectly. Consider what it is. Allow God to illuminate your path. Because when you walk like the fool, you're not allowing God to illuminate the path. You're just going wherever it is that you want to. And eventually you're going to walk off the edge. <laughs> eventually, if you, the path ain't illuminated, you can just walk right off the edge and boom, there you go. He said, redeem the time. Make good value of your time. Make wise decisions of your time for the Lord. Use the opportunities that you have for the Lord. Allow time for the Spirit to influence you. I can remember as it, when I was younger, I took it, every advantage as I could to make overtime. Oh, I worked it. Oh, yeah, if I could get overtime. We was talking about that. Jewel was telling me about all the hours that Caleb's had to work, but he's working salary. You know, so when you work salary, you don't get overtime. But I was salary, but I also got on paying jobs, I got overtime. So uh, I'd work weekends. I'd work, uh, I'd work uh, we'd go out and work all week at, at steel mills. We'd do every, everything because Brenda wasn't working. So I needed every dime that I could. You know, we, we was raising a family. I'd work weekends. I, I remember there for, for a space every other weekend for the space of about, it seemed like six months, maybe a year. We would drive on Friday night. We'd drive six hours. Uh, we'd get up to where we were going. We'd get up the next day. We'd work 13, 14 hours in the plant, and then we'd turn right back around and drive six hours right back to the house, and I'd make it home at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning on Sunday morning. Every chance I could, I was redeeming, I was cashing in my time. If I was going to get paid for it, I was going to do it. Now, if I wasn't getting paid for it, if I was just on one of them salary jobs that wasn't getting paid for, I might not have put in a whole lot more time because I wasn't getting paid for it. But if I was, Darren always said he slept really good when he hit double time. <laughs> When we was driving back on, to, uh, on being paid for it, and he hit double time, he said, I never could sleep real good on time and a half, but when I hit double time, I could, get, I could sleep really, really well. But Brenda, you know, so being able to do that took a lot of stress off of us when it came time to paying taxes and paying for Christmas presents and worrying about tires on the car. You kids remember one of these days you got to put tires on cars and you got to pay taxes. And, 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 and I can remember the first tax bill I got. I was like, what in the world is this? Mom and Dad never told me about this. Where did this come from? And then all of a sudden you got to realize those tires wear out, and all of a sudden those things cost four or five hundred dollars for one vehicle. And it's like, huh? Nobody told me about this. I don't have no money to pay for this. But you want to do that, so I was redeeming my time to cash it in. But even in those times when I was working those long weekends, getting home at two or three o'clock in the morning, I still redeemed my time for the Lord because I was there at Sunday school that day. I had to go sleep three or four hours, get up, shower, and I was ready to go. I redeemed my time for making money, but I also redeemed my time for the Lord because I wanted Him. I wanted His presence. I wanted God in my life. I I wanted to spend more time in, with the Lord. I wanted to be under God's influence. I wanted His light. I wanted His voice. I wanted His presence in me. And it made my spiritual life easier. As much as redeeming my time cash-wise made my life easier, redeeming my time spiritually made my life a whole lot easier because God gave me the opportunities to be able to redeem my time for cash. God was the one that was able. So it allowed me to stay under the influence of the Spirit. The more time I spent with Him, the more time I heard Him, the more time I was in His light. It kept the stress off of me of having to worry about what was going to happen in my life. I just simply trusted God. But then as you, um, as you get older, you don't really care so much about that overtime, do you? I don't care about it as much anymore. Of course, I don't get paid no overtime now. So, But uh, I don't know if I'd work it or not if it was available. But as you get older, you want to do what, you know, time becomes a more precious commodity, right? It still becomes, it's more precious, and I much rather spend time at home than I would worrying about overtime and stuff like that. But there's coming a day 
when I don't want to work anymore. <laughs> There's coming a day when I want to say that word, retire. <laughs> that I don't want to have to worry about working for money. And if I don't redeem my time now, if I'm not making all the money that I can now and being wise with the money that I make, when that day comes from retirement, and I haven't, even in my older, my advanced years, you might want to say, being more mature age-wise in numbers, if I'm not as wise, if I'm still not redeeming that time, if I'm still not redeeming, cashing in as much, taking as good care as I can, when that time comes from retirement, I'm not going to have it. I'm just going to have to continue to keep on working. And like I said, one of these days, there's going to come a day I don't want to. And I don't care what, at what stage you are in your salvation, whether you're brand new into it or you've been in here 50 years, you still have to redeem your time because there's still some time. <laughs> We still have time for the Lord. And I can't just because I'm getting a little bit older and I've been in this thing for 40 years or whatever it is, I can't say, well, you know what? I don't have to be faithful to God. I don't have to be faithful to church. I, I, don't have, I still want to be here at men's prayer service. I still want to be here at youth service because we got an adult Bible study. I still want to be working on vacation Bible school. I still want to go to youth conferences because I want to be involved. I want to, I want to redeem as much time as I can. I want to be in the presence of God as much as I possibly can. I want to be hearing that voice. I want that light. And every, I can, yeah, I can stay under the influence at home. I can stay at home and be under the influence of television or whatever else it might be out there. But I'd much rather be under the influence of God. I'd rather much redeem my time here and spend as much time as I... Again, who does, this hit, who does these messages hit first? It hits me, okay? And God's saying, Dwayne, you need to redeem your time and get away from the television. Maybe pray a little bit more. Maybe read the Word a little bit more. Maybe study a little bit more. Dwayne, read, it hits me way before it ever hits any of you guys. But I can remember back a couple weeks ago, we went to the national sales meeting, and we were flying out on Thursday morning, so we talked them into letting us go down Wednesday and paying for a hotel, and we could stay Wednesday night there in Charlotte before we got on. And so I was like, hey, we need to leave pretty early. I have salary, so I can kind of come, not come and go as I please, but I have a little bit of leeway. Um, and we were on company time anyway, so we were driving. So I was like, we need to leave about 3 o'clock so we get in the hotel real early. And so when we got down there, I was like, I got time to get to church at Darren's church because I want to be in the presence of God as much as I can. I purposely planned it so that I got in there and got there on time, to, got into the hotel, ate, got into the hotel where I could just turn around and have just enough time to get to Darren because I want to be in the presence of God at all times. I want to be, I want to be under his influence as much as I can because the days, they're getting evil. <laughs> The world's pushing this agenda hard, pushing it hard, more and more every day. And eventually, if you don't, if you like to play the neutrality thing and you don't like the ruffle feathers, that you know that's fine. One of these days, you're gonna have to take a stand. One of these days, you're gonna have to say, "Here's my line. I got to stand in, and I can't back up no further. I've got to do it." But the world's pushing that agenda. So we need God's influence in our lives. We need God's influence in our lives and our jobs in our marriages, even in our vacations. You know, and I think about you think about something as simple as a job. Think about something as simple as that. But I, I want God's influence in my life. I want, I want to know where God wants me. I want to know where God can bless me the most. I want to know if God says, Dwayne, you know, you can go work down here, but you can't make that much money. Let me take you over here, and I can bless you a whole lot more. Now, I might like working down here. I might like working over here because that's something fun and it's interesting. But God says, Dwayne, I can't bless you as much there. Let me take you over here. I know it may not be as fun and may not be as interesting, but you know what? You may have to sit behind a desk and a computer, for, but I can bless you a whole lot. Because truthfully, I'd rather much. I just. I, Truthfully, I'd rather be in the middle of a plant with a bunch of guys working in mud and grease and stuff like that. I, that's me. I'd rather do that than sit in an office behind. But I can be blessed a whole lot better in behind that because that's where God's put me. And that's what I want to do. I want to go where God wants me to go. All the way down to just think about my kids in college. I want God's blessings. And I've told them, I want God deciding where they want to go to school. 
I want them to listen to God and to listen to the college courses that they want. I was talking with Sister Adrian, and I just kind of texted her while I was typing up notes for it one day. And, and she had told me, you know, I said, I, I'm taking it that you listened to the Lord about going to college, and you prayed and everything. And she said, yeah. She said, I prayed, and I asked for the leading. And she said, I had came to Radford, and when I got here, excuse me. She said, when I got here, it just felt like home. She said, when I came to the school, it just felt like it was home. And she said, now, there was a lot of people that wasn't, Sister Kay, I don't know. You just close your ears. I don't know. Um, she said, there was a lot of people that just was not pleased with the decision for me to go. And she said, there was even, I had pushback from people in the church that she went to. She said she had pushback from the leadership in her church. You shouldn't go there. Because she had done a lot of stuff there in the church that she was at. She was heavily involved. And they wanted her you know, the pastor likes it when people stay here. But you know what? But when it comes to the will of God, when it comes to the will of you know, you know, we want to keep those people here. But I've told my kids, you know, if it's God's will for you to go somewhere, go. I want it to be God's will. Now, I'm not going to follow you. <laughs> I'm not going wherever you're at, whatever it is, because I know where God wants me at. I'm right where I'm supposed to be. But she said the pull of God was so strong in her life. She's a people pleaser. She's a little bit like me. And she hates to say no. She said, but the pull of God was so strong in her life that she had the ability to be able to overcome that instinct just to do what things, what everybody else wants you to do, just to kind of fall in line. Because she knew that God had a plan for her, and she, uh, and he allowed, uh, she allowed him to influence her and help her make her decision. And then she said, when I did that, when I made my decision, everything just began to fall in place. She said, all my financial stuff fell in place, and then she got to come to church here, she met what's his name back there <laughs> I can remember Kirk was up here for the we it was a, the her first week here was when we had a family reunion and Kirk left early on Saturday morning drove to Rafford got her and brought her to church here and it was just like natural it really was because it was the Lord's will and if you allow God you don't have to fight decisions when you allow God to make them you don't have to fight decisions when you sit there and say, God, open the door and close the door. Whatever it is, God, I'll allow you to open it. It's just like with jobs. Every time I prayed, God, if you want me there, fine. If you don't, let my interview fail. I don't care. Because, God, I'll go wherever you want. If you want the door closed, close it. But if you want the door open, open it, and I'll go through it. Because I want God's influence on my life. And when you have that kind of relationship, when you're in his presence and when his light's in you and his voice is in you and those are the things you're seeing and those are the things you're hearing, that's, again, that's when life gets easy. You know, we fret over decisions so much. Oh, should I do this? Or should, oh, do I need to do that? I don't know. But, man, life can get so much easier when we just allow God. We just kick back and say, Get you a ticket for LUI, not driving under the influence, but I'm living under the influence. I, I want a ticket where people say, I'm going to write you a ticket for living under the influence of God. I'll take those tickets all day long. I, I want to stack those up at the house. For my kids, I want the spouse that God wants for them. I don't want somebody else, to, somebody hooking them up with somebody they think is okay. Well, you can screw somebody's life up in a heartbeat with doing stuff like that. But if you wait for God to send the right person at the right time, everything will just, man, everything will just be good. Everything, will, again, allowing that right, the, that, that right, the, the voice of God. The kids are back here. I'll finish it up right quick. Um, I heard a story this week about the USS Fitzgerald. Um, it's a, a destroyer. And so one night in 2017, it was off of the coast in Japan. Uh, it was dark night. You know, of course, they turned the lights off on those things, and they're supposed to have all the electronics and the radar and stuff to help them be able to, 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 to work. And the captain had already had gone to bed. Uh, he had uh, been a long day, I guess, and it was uh, been doing the sea trials for the thing and the workups and stuff, so he'd had a long day, had a long uh, uh, tour coming ahead of him, went to bed, <coughs> and he left the deck in charge of a young crew and an inexperienced crew. And so the radar was set wrong. They had a lot of issues going on that night. They had old software, old Windows version, versions of Windows. A lot, a lot of stuff was going on. They were in darkness. They had no light. They had inexperienced voices to help with them in time of trouble. So all of a sudden, here comes this, because the radar was set wrong, all of a sudden, here comes this container ship. And they see it coming straight for them. You know, the officer of the deck says, Sharp turn right. And so if that's maritime rules. Is if you are a ship and you see another ship coming to you, everybody turns right. Because if everybody turns right, 
everybody's okay. You know, if you turn right and I turn right and we're coming at each other, we're all going to be okay. But then all of a sudden the officer of the deck changed the, the, the command and said, hey, well, no, 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 turn left and go full speed. And when they did, that turned that ship right in broadside to that container ship. Now, the battleship weighs about 9,000 tons. The container ship weighs about 30,000 tons. You take a 300-person, run them at about 20 miles an hour into a 90-pound person and find out what happens. So when that container ship, you know, they got that big bubble up underneath that con- has all their sonar and all that stuff in it. When that container ship hit that, that rammed that uh, destroyer, it pierced all the berthing units, all the sleeping places, and, of course, it was nighttime. All the sleeping stations underneath it pierced them, and they flooded with water, and seven uh, sailors lost their life because they couldn't get out because it was dark. Now, don't you think them people would have liked to have said, Jesus, take the wheel? <laughs> don't you feel like they, they would have sat there and said, Jesus, why don't you take the wheel? And that's how people are. Because they sing that song, Jesus, take the wheel, but they want Jesus to take the wheel when they see the crash coming. When they see the problems coming. When they see the, when they see the sickness coming. Oh, Lord, take control of my life. But they want to drive the car their way, every, all the us of the time. But the, God, God can work that way, but I don't want God to work that way in my life. I want God in the driver's seat so that he sees the crash up ahead and we go in a whole completely different direction. We go in the right direction. I want to be willing and able to be able to pray, God, not my will, but thine. I want to have the moxie. I want to have the ability and the desire and the will to say, God, whatever it is that you want to, God, take my life in that direction, whatever it is. And you have to choose to allow the Spirit to have influence in your life. You have to be the one, because God is not going to take a hook and take us and pull. Now, He could. Yes, God could grab, put a hook in our mouth and drag us wherever it is that He wanted to. But that's not the way God made us. God gave us a will. And He wanted to see, will you serve me? Will you serve me with your will? And that'd be nice if we would. So we have to consider our ways. We've got to make the most of the time that we have to spend with him. We've got to be filled with his presence. We have to keep him in our hearts. We've got to keep him in our minds. There's lots of influences out in the world. There's a lot of, Paul even said in Corinthians, there's a lot of voices. And some of them are significant. But he said there's a lot of voices that are out there. But there's only one voice that can illuminate. There's only one light that illuminates my path. And that's the Lord's, the, the, the path to heaven. So let God illuminate your life, Pastor.